nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. You can follow along with this presentation by going to nanohub.org and downloading the corresponding slides. Enjoy the show. So the topic this morning is phonon transport. So we've been talking about electron transport, but and I'm an electrical engineer, but when you when you do electron transport, you always dissipate power and the semiconductor heats up and this is a major concern. So it's always intimately connected to heat transfer, heat transport. And this is a topic that our colleagues in mechanical engineering and other fields spend a lot of time talking about, but even if you're just interested in electrical transport, you have to understand something about heat transport and phonon transport. So the goal of this lecture is to present a, uh, you know, to try to have a look at phonon transport and see if we can establish the main, uh, the main properties and principles and theoretical expressions that people use just by using what we've developed so far and adapting it to phonons. And we'll see that that's possible and we can get all of the standard expressions that you find in textbooks on heat transport. So, just by way of reminder, we've been talking only about electrons so far. And we've developed current equations for heat transport. But that's the heat transported by the electrons, which may or may not be the dominant carrier of heat. But these are the expressions that tell us which portion of the heat is carried by the electrons. So the notation I'm going to try to use, by the way, if you're if you printed this out last night, I did some editing, so there'll be some minor changes from the copy that you have, but you can download the, the uh, current one from this website over here. So the notation that I'm going to use is that the superscript little q means it's the heat carried by the electrons. The superscript capital Q means it's the heat carried by the phonons. So this is what we've had to date. You know, we have heat can be carried the first term pi sigma e. We always remember when you see an electric field here, if I have concentration gradients, then more generally I should replace that by the gradient of the quasi Fermi level. So there's an easy replacement. When there's uniform carrier density, I can just replace that by the electric field. So the first term is something like the Peltier effect. The last term has to do with thermal diffusion down a temperature gradient. I can write that in one of two ways. They're just mathematically equivalent. The second way brings in the Peltier coefficient. We've got the mathematical definition of these two uh, thermal conductivities. Now in metals, this is most of the story. But in semiconductors and insulators, it's not. You know, there it's, uh, the heat is carried by uh, lattice vibrations. So this is just a brief look at how we think about phonon transport. One of the things I want to do is to discuss the differences. So you know, in electrical transport, you can go from insulators to metals. You can go, your conductivities, your electrical conductivities can go over 20 orders of magnitude. The thermal conductivities go over, what, three orders of magnitude or so? You know, much less. You know, you know why is that? What's, what's the difference between electrons and phonons? So, <clears throat> Professor uh, Fisher did some discussion about phonons, so I don't have to say very much, but let me just remind you of a few things. We actually don't, there's just a few basic considerations that we need to know. You know, we've been talking about electrons, you know, and the gas of electrons in a metal or a semiconductor is really a very complicated interacting system. But one of the triumphs of condensed matter physics many years ago was that you could treat this complicated th system, you know, the excitations of this, con of this complicated system as a set of independent particles or quasi-particles. Those are the electrons that we've been dealing with. And those electrons are described by a Schrodinger equation. They're waves. If we solve the Schrodinger equation in a periodic lattice, we get th these dispersions. So that's our E of K. Because the crystal is periodic, the dispersion is also periodic, and it's periodic over this Brillouin zone. So when 1D, K goes to plus pi over A and minus pi over A, where A is the lattice spacing, and if I go beyond that, I just repeat the solutions. <clears throat> now to describe a particle, a wave is not localized, so to describe a, a localized particle, I have to go around a certain K or momentum, and I have to add 
different Ks and make a wave packet to try to localize it. So that way I can localize, my, my electron particle is really a wave packet of wavelengths that are near some particular momentum. And if I want to know the velocity of that wave packet, or that's my electron particle, the velocity is just given by the slope of the E of K. All right. Now, we've been approximating this E of k by a, a, a simple parabolic approximation. This is our parabolic band approximation. This frequently works pretty well for electrons. We, we use it very often. But I mean, the valence band, the parabola goes down. Okay. Sometimes we have to do better than that, and then we treat the entire E of k as given by a computed band structure, and that can be done too. Now, how about phonons? So we have the lattice vibrating. And we can think of, we can decompose these vibrations into their normal modes. And we can think of the excitations of these normal modes as particles. These quasi-particles are phonons, quantized lattice vibrations. So they're analogous to the electrons. OK, but those uh, lattice waves are in a periodic crystal. So we can compute the dispersion of the phonons also. And we'll get something that looks like this. And since it's in the same crystal with the same period, periodicity, it'll, the solutions will be periodic over a Brillouin zone, just like the electrons were. You know, again, I can uh, describe a phonon by a wave packet. And if I want to know what the velocity of the phonon is, I just take the slope of the, of the E of k about that point. And, uh, so uh, group velocity is gradient of omega. So normally when we're talking about phonons, we plot the frequency versus wave vector. I'll use Q so that we can keep things straight. When I say K, I mean the wave vector of the electron. When I say Q, I mean the wave vector of the phonon. Usually we plot energy for electrons and we plot omega for phonons on the vertical axis, but energy is h bar omega. So they're really the same thing. Okay, so we have these dispersions. Now, we also have simple ways, when we want to analytically compute quantities, we have simple descriptions analogous to the effective mass description for electrons. And the simple descriptions are the bottom type of waves, we simplify by treating it with a straight line. This is called the Debye approximation. If I want to do the part of the dispersion that's at higher energy, that would be called an Einstein model, where I just say the, the uh, frequency is independent of the wave vector. Okay. And just uh, remember from your freshman physics or high school physics, you know, you have this mass on a spring problem. If I have some spring constant K and I pull the mass down from its equilibrium position, it'll just start to oscillate. Yeah. I can describe the potential energy as parabolic, you know, so I differentiate it to get the force. I could set up the equations of motion and I could solve those and I would find that we oscillate in time. And you'd find that the frequency is the square root of the spring constant divided by the mass. Now, if I wanted to know the energy, the energy is going to be proportional classically to the amplitude of the oscillation. The, the more, more it's oscillating, the more its energy is. But I know quantum mechanically everything is quantized. And this is one of the first problems you do in quantum mechanics. You learn how to quantize a harmonic oscillator, and the energy levels then come in discrete units, n plus one half times h bar omega. Okay. So these phonons are going to be something like this problem, because I can think of the bonding forces between atoms in the crystal like springs, and they vibrate back and forth, they have some spring constant, they have some frequency, and it's going to do something similar to this. So the general features of a, of a phonon dispersion then would look something like this. We, we have different, the displacement of the atoms can be in the direction that the wave is propagating, that would be longitudinal. So this particular mode would be called a longitudinal acoustic mode because it's like the, it's like the propagation of sound in the atmosphere or the distribution, you know, the, my sound waves from my voice that are carrying to you, the, the disturbance is longitudinal in the direction of the propagation of the sound waves. So this is called longitudinal acoustic. Now 
I could also have the propagation in the orthogonal directions. So there are two orthogonal directions. So there are two modes that correspond to the other two directions, transverse to the direction of propagation. Okay. But there's another set of modes uh, up here, these high frequency modes, and these correspond to atoms in a unit cell vibrating against each other instead of in the same direction the way the acoustic modes are. I think Professor Fisher said a little bit about those. But those are a different set of modes. They, they have a frequency that's much higher and that is much less sensitive to the wave vector. So there's a longitudinal optic mode. It's called optic because in a polar material, these kind of modes can interact with light. And there are two transverse optic modes. Okay. So remember that the slope of the omega versus k is the velocity. So the slope of the longitudinal acoustic mode is the sound velocity. And this is something you, you look up on Wikipedia, you can find the sound velocity of any material. It's frequently measured and easily found. Now, you'll notice that the optical phonons have a small slope. So they, it's hard for them to carry very much heat because they don't move very fast. So it's the first order people usually say most of the heat is carried by the acoustic modes. All right, and depending on the particular crystal, you'll see sometimes these lines are degenerate. They're at the same frequency. Uh, if you have a nonpolar semiconductor at the zone boundary, you'll see this LO mode have the same solution as the LA mode. So we'll look at a real dispersion here in, in a minute. Oh, so here it is. So this is a comparison. So these are two different dispersions, and this is for silicon. So the one on the uh, left is for electrons along a 111 direction in silicon. So you can see the two valence bands down there. You can see the minimum of the conduction band out near the zone edge. That, that's that ellipsoid, one of those six ellipsoids in the conduction band minimum of silicon. Um, and you'll notice that the scale there is electron volts. You know, this is going over quite a sizable energy scale. I mean, the thermal energy is 0.025 electron volts. So it's small compared to this scale. So you could run this, you go on NanoHub and run Band Structure Lab and you can produce a plot like this. So this is a computed phonon dispersion. And so it looks similar. You know, it's periodic in the same uh, Brillouin zone. You can see the longitudinal and transverse modes. You can see this is a nonpolar material, so those longitudinal optic and uh, longitudinal acoustic modes meet at the edge of the zone boundary. You can see that the longitudinal optic and the transverse optic are the same at Q equals zero. All right. So this is what a typical phonon dispersion looks like. But there's one very big difference that you can see immediately. And that is, look at the energy scale. Instead of going in electron volts, it's going in hundreds of electron volts. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, remember, remember, the frequency was square root of spring constant over mass. You know, the, the atoms are very massive, so the frequency is low. So the energy h bar omega is much lower. So there's a very big difference between the energy scale of the electrons and the phonons. And that ends up being quite important. So we're going to talk, say more about that later. Now, you can also compute the wavelength of the uh, phonons. And I, I've moved this into the appendix in this material. So it's a simple little derivation, but I won't go through the algebra, but I'll just give you the answer. One of the other differences is if you compute the average de Broglie wavelength of an electron in silicon at room temperature, it's about 60 angstroms. If you compute the average wavelength of a phonon in silicon at room temperature, uh, it's, uh, it's about a tenth of that. So the phonons have very small wavelengths, the electrons have much larger wavelengths. You know, when you start talking about things like phonon confinement, you'd have to go to much smaller structures to see phonon confinement. You can see electron confinement in much larger structures. Okay, so that's really all, all that we're going to need to know about phonons to see if we can figure out a way to compute the heat conductivity using the formalism that we've developed and just adapting it to these other particles. Okay. So here's the model that we've been using from day one. You know, it's current, you know, this is something now 
I hope everyone remembers. If you take away one thing from the course, you remember that formula. And you not just memorize the formula, but you remember its physical significance. So 2q over h times the transmission. Now I'm going to put sub, uh, subscripts on these. T sub e l is the transmission coefficient for electrons, because now I'm going to be talking about phonons too. M sub e l is the number of conducting channels for electrons. And F1 minus F2, it always takes a difference in occupation for current to flow. And our two reservoirs, our two equilibrium reservoirs, we describe by equilibrium Fermi functions. That gives us the population of the states in the equilibrium reservoirs. Okay, so if we were to adapt this model to phonons, we would do something like this. We would say we have two big chunks of material that are in thermal equilibrium, possibly at different temperatures. And we have a material in between that we're interested in computing the thermal conductance of. And that material in between might be a nanostructure, it might be a carbon nanotube, we want to compute the thermal conductance of it. But it might actually be a big chunk of silicon and I want to compute the thermal conductivity of bulk silicon. My channel could be a bulk material. So. We'll just characterize that. If we know the dispersion of that channel, you know, then we'll know how to deal with it. So we have to be able to compute the dispersion. When we start getting down to nanostructures, and you have thin structures, and you apply uh, boundary conditions, then the dispersion that you get, say, in bulk silicon, if you look at the dispersion in a silicon nanowire, it will, it will be quite different, because there are different boundary conditions and, to apply. So, so the dispersion will be different, but that's OK. Whatever the, if we can compute the dispersion, then we can compute the thermal conductance. We have two thermal reservoirs, and uh, that means we have a thermal equilibrium population of phonons in each of those thermal reservoirs. We describe phonons, those are Bose particles, so we describe them, their occupation by a Bose-Einstein distribution, just like we describe the electrons by a Fermi-Dirac. So it looks similar. There's a minus one instead of a plus one. And another important difference is there's no Fermi level for phonons. There is for electrons. So I don't have to, the Fermi level helps me conserve particles. You know, if I know what the electron density is, then I deduce the location of the Fermi level to give me that electron density. And electrons don't, you know, it's, it's hard to create or destroy electrons unless I add in recombination generation processes. But it's easy to, I don't, I don't need to conserve the number of phonons. It's easy to create uh, phonons. So I have two different reservoirs, both in thermal equilibrium, described by Bose-Einstein factors at two different temperatures. Okay. So I would expect an equation like this to describe thermal transport. And I just have to figure out how to change it so that I can describe the flow of heat instead of the flow of electricity. All right, so how would we do that? So our current for electrical current is on top, and the expression for heat current is right below it. So the way we look at it, first of all, we look at this. There's a 2Q there, and the Q is because I'm interested, charge is flowing. That's, that's why I have a Q there. The 2 is for spin. We just chose, you know, I could have included the spin in the number of channels, you know, there, there's, I, I could have embedded it in that, in that, but people like to put it out front. That's what the two means. Okay, so if I'm going to adapt that formula, instead of charge, what I'm carrying is energy. So I have to replace Q by h bar omega, right? But then I have to bring it inside the integral because Instead of energy, I'm going to say d h bar omega, just so I can remember that I'm dealing with the energy of a phonon now. It's the same thing. Uh, I don't have a 2 because I don't have spin, but I have polarization, right? I have longitudinal and 2 transverse. So what people conventionally do is they put the polarization in m. So that will have to, m, the number of channels, I'll have, I'll have channels for each polarization, longitudinal and transverse. So then you can see it's very analogous. I still have the 1 over h. Inside, h bar omega is the energy. When we did heat flow for electrons, we had energy minus Fermi level. But there's no Fermi level for phonons. 
We have transmission now, but it's transmission for phonons. We have the number of channels, but it's the number of channels for the phonons. And instead of an F1 minus F2, we have an N1 minus N2 for the Bose-Einstein packet. Everything's the same. Okay. Now, we, again, we're assuming ideal contacts. You know, and sometimes when people do these nanostructures, they sometimes spend a, a lot of time thinking about, you know, do you really have an ideal contact? Uh, how do you engineer the contact such that the lattice vibrations don't reflect when they go out of the big region into the small region? For electrons, um, it's relatively easy to achieve. For some of the nanostructures, it's not as easy to achieve, and people account for that. There's a factor for the transmission that comes from the phonons transmitting from the contact into the channel. So the transmission is not necessarily just due to scattering in the channel. <clears throat> okay, so here's our expression, just like the other one. All right. And if we're interested in small temperature gradients, then we'll be talking about near equilibrium transport. So then we're going to be interested in expanding N1 minus N2 for small temperature differences. And we do it the same way. We'll do a Taylor series expansion in temperature. So N1 minus N2 is minus the partial of N with respect to temperature times the temperature difference. And now I can just differentiate that Bose-Einstein factor, and that's what I get. And let's see. Now, I'll just point out, if I were to differentiate that Bose-Einstein factor with respect to energy, I would get something that is very similar. <clears throat> in fact, the derivative that I want in doing this Taylor series expansion is dn dt, and that's just minus dn d h bar omega times h bar omega over tl. Okay. Now, why do that? The reason is, you remember in our expressions for electrical current, we had inside the integral a minus df dE. Okay. Okay. dN dH bar omega is like the minus df dE. So now I have something that looks like what I did for electrons. That's, that's the reason for doing it. So our final expression, this is just a Taylor series expansion, right? Just doing that derivative. So now I can do near equilibrium transport because we just put that expression into our expression for heat flow. And you can see, you're going to get a whole bunch of complicated stuff times with a minus sign out front times delta t. We're going to get heat flow is minus some constant times delta t. Right. That's what we expect. Heat should flow down a temperature gradient. And the kl is all of those terms that I collect up together. So the kl looks kind of a little bit complicated, but you know the procedure was straightforward. Um, we've got a bunch of constants out front. We have a transmission. We have a number of channels. And we have a bunch of things that came from this Taylor series expansion. Okay. Now remember what the electrical conductance looked like. The electrical conductance had some stuff out front, which ended up being the quantum of conductance. And then we learned that conductance comes in discrete chunks. It had a transmission for electrons. We've got that for the phonons. It had a number of channels for electrons. We've got that for phonons. And it had a minus dFDE, which acts like a window function. What it does is it selects the on, only where minus dFDE is finite. That's the only contribution I get to the integral. Current only flows near the Fermi level. That's where minus dFDE is finite. So we think of that as a window function. It selects out the energies. It tells us which energies are responsible for current flow. And in, for electrons, it's just something very simple, simple, minus df naught dE. And if you integrate that, you know, it's an easy thing to do. Just sit down and integrate that from mi minus infinity to plus infinity. You can see that the integral of that is 1. So it's normalized. So it looks like the stuff in the curly brackets there is we're tempting to call that a window function. It looks like it's playing the same role for phonons that the minus dFDE did. Okay, so let's look at that window function for phonons a little more. We take that out. 
If I were to integrate that, I could see whether it's normalized or not. And that turns out to be an integral that can be done. I don't integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. I integrate from zero. You know, in the, uh, in the window function for uh, electrons, the Fermi level can be above or below the conduction band edge, so I have both minus and, and positive energies. For phonons, I only have positive energies. You do that integral, and it turns out to be pi squared over three. That can be done. So if I multiply by 3 over pi squared inside, then that quantity will be normalized. And then I bring the pi squared over 3 out front. OK. So I'm going to call that my window function. And we'll have a look at that. It's normalized, just like the other one was. We now have Fourier's law. We have an expression for the thermal conductance that is some stuff out front which is going to be the quantum of thermal conductance. So just like electrical conductance is quantized, thermal conductance will be quantized. We have transmission, number of modes, times the window function. And uh, the quantum of thermal conductance and the window functions look like this. So everything maps very, very nicely. And electrical current was the same thing. Instead of Fourier's law, we had electrical current is G times delta V. We had an expression for G. We had a quantum of electrical conductance. We had a window function for electrons. Nice symmetry. Now, if you look at those window functions, and for <coughs> electrons, we want to plot it as E minus EF. So as I said, we can have both positive and negative. The Fermi level can be either above or below the channel that we're interested in looking at. If you look at the red line, that's minus df dE, just the derivative of the Fermi function. You can see it's peaked. It has a width that's a few kT. The area under that curve is 1 because it's normalized. If I lower the temperature to 50 Kelvin, the uh, window function gets much sharper. The area under it is still 1. Now, if you look at this phonon window function, we just plot positive energies. Okay. But it, it looks like the it looks very similar to the positive half of the electrons. If you look at 300 K, it's got a width of several KT. Looks like it's just a little bit wider than the electron one. The area under it is one because we've normalized it. If you cool it down, KT is much smaller, it becomes much more peaked. You know, just looks like the positive looks pretty much like the positive half of the electron one, even though its expression is much more complicated. Okay, so, so the general models, you know, very, very nice mapping. They look very similar. So we should see now if we could uh, calculate the thermal conductivity and see what happens then. So I'm only going to think about the diffusive regime. So we'll take the expression that we've just developed and we will insert in for the transmission, and we might, you know, we could treat ballistic phonon transport if we wanted to, but I'm just going to look at the diffusive limit. So in, in the diffusive limit, it will be the mean free path for the phonons divided by the length of the sample. And I'm going to expect the, uh, the phonon modes to be proportional to A, cross-sectional area, just like it is for the electrons. We can work it out from the from the dispersion or the density of states. So I have charge, I have heat flow is minus kappa times the temperature difference. If I multiply by L over A and divide by L over A, I'll get the first expression on the bottom on the left. The reason for doing that is that delta T divided by the length of the sample looks like a derivative. So it's like a dt dx. And I know that conductance is thermal conductivity times length times area divided by length. So what's in the parentheses there is really the thermal conductivity in watts per meter Kelvin. So we'll take that expression at the top, which is in capital K sub L is the conductance. And we'll express it in terms of a current density and a temperature gradient. And that brings in this thermal conductivity, which is the parameter that people are usually interested in and measure. Okay. 
So that gives us a, an expression. The thermal conductivity then in the diffusive limit is this quantum of conductance times the mean free path for phonons times the number of channels per square center, per cross-sectional area times the window function integrated over all frequencies. You know, very similar to the expression that we get for electrical current. Instead of a thermal conductivity, we have an electrical conductivity. Instead of a gradient in temperature, we have a gradient in quasi-Fermi level. We have a different sign because electrons are negatively charged. Uh, the expressions for the lattice thermal conductivity and the expressions for the electrical conductivity that we've seen earlier look very much the same. Okay. All right, now I just want to do a little bit of algebra here. If I divide that expression by, by the integral of m divided by a times window function integrated over frequency, that's what I would define as the effective number of channels that are participating in heat flow because the window function is selecting out the ones that contribute to heat flow. So that's what I call bracket, you know, the, the effective number of channels. Now, what I'm left with there, it looks like I'm averaging the mean free path and weighting it by some quantity m times window function. So I'll define that as my average mean free path. So it just allows me to write the equation in a simpler form. The thermal conductance is quantum of conductance times the effective number of channels that participate in thermal heat flow <coughs> times the average mean free path and the precise mathematical definition of those average quantities is given over here. Right? Just a simpler way to remember it. Okay. So again, we, earlier we wrote the electrical cond conductance there. So it looks like everything is pretty much the same between electrons and phonons. All right, so now we have to get down to the point where, where we actually have to work this out. So to work this out, we need to discuss two things. We know all about the window function in the integral, so that's no problem, we'll put it in. Then we have to talk about the mean free path for phonon scattering. I had a whole lecture, lecture six, on scattering of electrons, so I'm just gonna have a slide or two to say a few words about scattering for phonons. And, but we have to figure out what the number of channels is for the phonons also. Okay. All right, but I'm going to take a little detour first of all, and uh, I'm going to... You will often see expressions, you will often see in the literature that kappa is proportional to the specific heat. So I want to take a little detour and show you where that comes from, just so that when you see that, you know what the connection is. So what's the specific heat? So the, the, the total thermal energy per unit volume associated with the lattice vibrations is something that it would be easy for us to compute. If we knew the density of states for phonons, and that's something that you can calculate from the dispersion, the way we we'd calculate the density of states for electrons from the dispersion. And if you weight the density of states, the number of states at that energy, by the energy of the phonons at that point, and weight by the probability that that state is occupied, and integrate over all phonon energies, you'll get the total thermal energy. And then the specific heat tells us how much that energy changes per degree Kelvin change in temperature. So if I differentiate that, I get the specific heat per unit volume. And when I take that derivative, the Bose factor has an exponential dependence on temperature, so if there's any temperature dependence of the density of states, it's going to be pretty small. And I can just take the derivative of that Bose factor, and I'll get an expression for the density, of, uh, for the specific heat. So this is a quantity that's relatively easy to measure. You can look this up easily for whatever material you need, what the specific heat of silicon is. Easy to find. You can find it on Wikipedia. Okay, now, so, bear with me and, and you'll see where I'm going. So I have a derivative of n with respect to t. We saw that earlier, that we could write that as proportional to minus the n, the phonon energy. Okay. So if I do that, then I get an expression that looks like this. Okay. All right. So, bottom line, I get an expression that looks somewhat similar to the expression I had for the thermal conductivity. 
You know, I have a density of states times the window function times some things out front. So if you compare those two expressions, you can see that they look similar. Now you remember we had that we discussed how the number of channels is proportional to velocity times the density of states. So I could have written the thermal conductivity in terms of that same density of states. And then I would start to have some things that look quite similar. Okay. Now it takes a little bit of uninspiring algebra, and I've included it at the end, just to show you that you can, you can write that lattice thermal conductivity in this form. One third average mean free path, this is a little different mean free path, average phonon velocity times the specific heat. Okay. Now th this is a very common textbook expression. You know, you, you see this in most introductory solid state books, probably lots of places that there are simple kinetic arguments you can use to derive this. And this is a widely used expression. So people will estimate the lattice, if people want an estimate of what is the mean free path for phonons, what they'll do is they, they know the specific heat, that's a well-known, you know, if it's a large material, that's a well-known quantity. They'll measure the lattice thermal conductivity. They will guess at what the average velocity is, and they'll might, they might say, well, the longitudinal uh, acoustic phonons carry most of the heat. We'll just use the sound velocity for them. And then they'll estimate what the mean free path is. So it's a very useful formula, very widely used. The difficulty is, in these simple derivations, it's not at all clear exactly what is that average mean free path. How would you compute it from you know, detailed scattering processes? Exactly what is that average velocity? Is it the sound velocity or is it something else? And the point of all of that uninspiring algebra is that when you go through and, and do this, it's in the appendix to this, you can get precise <coughs> expressions. So now you know how those averages are defined. And I'll refer you to a paper by Changwook, who's really my, my co-author on this talk this morning, uh, that was recently published in JAP where he shows you some specific results. And for example, that average velocity can be quite different from the sound velocity. So, but it, so the advantage of our formalism is that it tells us exactly what these are. Uh, notice that that mean free path, the capital lambda, is the V tau. You know, that's what people usually call mean free path. If you're dealing, if you're using a Landauer approach, you want the mean free path for backscattering. And we talked about how there's some statistical factors. In 3D, it's 4 thirds right, times V tau. Okay, so, you know, what was the point of doing all of that? Well, you know, as I mentioned, you find this expression many places. And you, you know, when you look at this, you might wonder, how does this expression relate to the ones that you've developed from the Landauer approach? All right, we're describing the same problem, so they have to be mathematically equivalent. And we've just shown you that they're equivalent. But now we also have precise definitions of those quantities. All right, if you want to see how that's derived, you know, there are many, many places that you can have a look at that. And here are, here are two references that, that I use. Okay, now, when we do electrons, we make a lot of use of a simplified dispersion. We, we use the effective mass approximation frequently. And sometimes it gets dangerous with students because you get so used to using the effective mass approximation, you forget that it doesn't always work. You know, sometimes you have to go back and use a better band structure. But it works very, very frequently. We rely on it. There's an analogous simple model for phonons called the Debye model. So let's take a look at that. Well, first of all, back to the effective mass. Why does it work so well? Remember, when I showed you that dispersion, the range of the dispersion, or the width of those bands, the, the bandwidth, went over electron volts. You know, the electrons have kT of thermal energy or something. The Fermi level is usually near the bottom of the band and not too far above it. So the electrons are always down near the bottom of the band. They usually don't get too far away from the bottom of the band. And that means this parabolic assumption is, usually works pretty well. Okay. We can get by, not always, but frequently. Right. 
So we rely on it a lot. Okay. Now, what happens for, uh, what, well, first of all, what is the Dubai model? So the Dubai model is, well, we have these acoustic modes. I could fit them on average. You know, they have two different velocities, so I could take a slope of a line that gives me a, a velocity that I would call the Dubai velocity, which is an approximation to those modes. And I could just approximate them by a straight line. Okay, okay if you do that, you can compute the density of states. Whenever we have a dispersion, we can compute a density of states. And uh, you know, I won't go through the details here, but it's done the same way you do it for electrons. These are the expressions we get for the density of states. Um, it's interesting that the, well, the number of channels is velocity times density of states. There's an h over four, I think. So you can see that the velocity is constant because the slope is constant in the Debye approximation. So the density of states goes as h bar omega squared and the number of channels goes as h bar omega squared. They have the same dependency. Okay, now, but there's a, no, okay. So first point is if most of the heat is conducted by, or is carried by phonons that are near the center of the Brillouin zone, or relatively close, where this is a good approximation, then we're pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Now, just as a caveat, if you go and look in standard textbooks, you'll see that the density of states that I wrote down isn't quite the, the answer that you'll get in the textbooks. Just because normally it's done as a function of frequency, I've done it as a function of h bar omega, just because I want to make the analogy to electrons. So it's density of states and phonon energy. And all that does is it brings in a, an extra h bar. So you, you have to worry about that. Okay, now, now you recall when I showed you the realistic dispersions, the bandwidth of electrons went over electron volts, but the bandwidth of phonons was 0.02 or 0.03 electron volts. It was on the order of kT. Also, another point to remember is there's a finite number of states. If you go all across the Brillouin zone and add up those states, there's a finite number. There's one for every atom in the solid. So, so if I were to integrate the states, well, I have a problem here now. If I just integrate that density of states across the entire Brillouin zone, so let's if I go and integrate that across the entire Brillouin zone, that approximation isn't very good at the edge of the Brillouin zone. I would get too many states, all right? So you could say, well, I could do a better approximation, I could have a piecewise linear model, but what people do is you have to make sure that you get the right number of states. So the way you get the right number of states is you integrate up in energy until you get the right number of states and then you stop and you stop that line. So what people will do is they'll take that phonon density of states and they'll integrate up to a frequency omega, or energy h bar omega, and they'll set that equal to the number of states that are there. So there's one for every atom in the solid times three for polarization, and we'll get the total number of states. That gives me a frequency or a wave vector, and I can't go above that or else I've got too many states. So then the Debye approximation will just look something like this. I'll just have to cut it off because that part of, of the function gives me all the states that are in the solid. Okay. Now, I don't have to worry about that for electrons because th that parabolic dispersion, if I integrated that over the entire Brillouin zone, it, it would give me way too many states. But I'm always right down near the bottom and I'm only occupying a tiny fraction of the states anyway. So I never worry about that for electrons. But for phonons, we have to. And uh, we'll see why in a, in a minute. So that gives me a Debye frequency. I could uh, convert that frequency. H bar omega is an energy. That's the maximum energy that I allow that linear dispersion to go up to. I could convert that into a temperature. Kt is an energy. That would be a Debye temperature. And that's a number that is frequently used. You can look it up and find out what it is in particular materials. It's, it's just a different way to express that cutoff energy, cutoff wave vector. Okay. And we're going to see a little later that the Debye model really works when 
the lattice temperature is much less than the Debye temperature. Okay, so now I could easily go in and I take my general expression for the thermal conductivity and I use my Debye approximation to approximate the dispersion. That gives me the density of channels or the number of channels, m of omega. I insert that in the integral. I only integrate up to omega, not all the way across the Brillouin zone. And these are classic models. You know, these are two really, these are two really good papers. And it's still, they're still very readable and very well worth reading and still highly cited. You know, we'd all hope that we could write a paper that 50 years later is still highly cited, but these folks did. You know, so I'd encourage you to have a look at those. They're very readable and, uh, and still very good. So let's, let's take a look at this. Um, it's possible to take that actual computed dispersion and to compute the number of channels rigorously from that. Okay. Don't make the Debye approximation. This is what the number of channels versus energy looks like for that silicon dispersion that I showed you earlier. All right? You know, pretty messy. Now, if I look at what the number of channels looks like in the Debye approximation, that's that red dashed line. Remember, it went as h bar omega squared, so you're seeing that parabola. For low energies, you can see that that, that fits, but it only fits for low energies. Okay. Now, if I look at my window functions, my window functions are going to tell me which of those channels are occupied. And here's the big difference. At room temperature, the window function is very broad. You can see that all of those channels are occupied, even the ones that, for which the Debye approximation is a terrible fit. Uh, at 50 degrees Kelvin, the window function is much more peaked, you know, near zero energies. The, uh, the blue dash line, which is going off scale there, is the window function at 50K. And you can see that it just populates the, uh, the states in the part of the density of modes that the Debye approximation works. So I would expect the Debye approximation to be pretty poor at room t temperature, but to be very good at 50 degrees Kelvin. Now, you know, why does that happen? It's because the bandwidth of this is only about 20 or 30 milli-electron volts. The width of the window function is on the order of kT. So all of the states across the Brillouin zone in the, for the phonons are occupied. For electrons, the bandwidth is on the order of electron volts. Only a few states near the center of the Brillouin zone are occupied that are well approximated by a parabola. So that makes it very difficult. The Debye approximation is widely used, but it's not nearly as good as the effective mass approximation that we use for electrons. Now, so here's, here's the situation for electrons. This is the same calculation for electrons. I sh we showed you the electron dispersion earlier on later. And you can calculate the number of modes for electrons. That's the red dashed line. There's a solid black line underneath it that's calculated from the rigorous band structure. In 3D, the number of channels uh, versus energy for electrons is linearly proportional to energy. So that's that straight line you see. Now, if you look at, you can see I'm only going up to 0.2 EV. If you look at the window function at room temperature, the solid blue line, you know, you can see that the dashed red line, which is the effective mass approximation, is falling right on top of the actual dispersion, and only states right near the bottom are being occupied. And at 50 degrees Kelvin, only states even closer to the bottom. So effective mass works really well for silicon, but the by approximation doesn't work nearly as well for phonons. So, you know, we're lucky for electrons because uh, many times we can avoid dealing with having to do everything numerically and having a table of E of K over the entire Brillouin zone. We're much less lucky with uh, phonons. Okay, so uh, a lot of these, in order to compute thermal conductivities rigorously, we need to do the integrals numerically because the simple analytical approximations just aren't very good for phonons. But we also have a mean free path inside that integral 
So let's talk for just a little bit about phonon scattering. Okay. So, you know, I'll remind you, lecture six, I talked about electrons. You know, they can scatter from defects, you know, charged impurities. A neutral impurity might perturb the crystal potential, and they have a weak scattering uh, cross-section also, crystal defects and other things. Electrons can scatter from phonons. They frequently do. That's frequently a strong mechanism. Electrons can scatter from surfaces and boundaries. Surface roughness scattering is a big deal for silicon MOSFETs. And electrons can scatter from other electrons, but that's usually not so important because it might destroy the momentum of one electron, but it's given its momentum to another. So on average, the ensemble, the momentum is conserved. And we compute those scattering rates from Fermi's golden rule. Okay, how about phonons? So phonons can scatter from uh, various types of defects. And it doesn't matter whether they're charged or not, but there could be some kind of impurity. Uh, there could be different isotopes of silicon in the same uh, piece of silicon. You know, these things occur in nature. There could be uh, dislocations and various other lattice defects that scatter phonons. Phonons can scatter from other phonons too. This turns out to be a more important process, and I'll, I'll show you why later. Um, phonons can scatter from surfaces and boundaries. So this is one of the things when people make thermoelectric devices out of nanowires, and if you roughen the nanowires, you can get a lot of phonon scattering and kill the thermal conductance, and that's one of the reasons people got excited about their thermoelectric properties, because you could reduce the, the thermal conductance. And phonons can scatter from electrons. So there's a phenomenon that you'll hear called uh, phonon drag, that if electrons and phonons are scattering strongly, then if I'm pushing electrons, or if, let's say I have heat flowing in one direction, then that momentum can be transferred to the electrons, because if they're scattering, so I can push the electrons along with the heat flow if the two systems are interacting. That's called phonon drag. Uh, usually, is Im it's usually is important at lower temperatures when we don't get other types of scattering processes. Okay. All right, so you know, what's phonon-phonon scattering is actually quite important. Now, if the crystal potential is purely harmonic, then that's what leads to the dispersion. And if it's purely harmonic, phonons just travel through without scattering. But there are higher order terms to give us anharmonic terms here, which act as scattering potentials and which knock you from one state to another. And the picture could be something like this. So here you can see I'm not conserving phonon number, but there's no, no need to. I have two phonons with two different wave vectors and two different energies coming in and scattering, and what goes out is a third phonon with a different momentum and different energy. But I have to conserve momentum, and I have to conserve energy in that scattering process. And you can compute these scattering rates from Fermi's golden rule the same way we do for electrons. Now, this process, again, we would argue that this process shouldn't have much effect on thermal conductivity, because the momentum is of the whole ensemble of phonons is conserved. All right, so no big deal. This is called a normal process. So this is the picture in the Brillouin zone. You know, we have two of them coming in, momentum is conserved. But if I think about the whole ensemble, you know, on average, nothing has happened. All right. Now there's another process called the uh, Umklapp process. One's normal. You would think the other one would be called abnormal, but it's not. It's called Umklapp, right? And it looks like this. What if those two incident phonons that interact and scatter and create this third phonon that's, that conserves momentum, what if they had larger momentum to begin with? Now momentum conservation would say that the red arrow should be bigger. But the red arrow bigger means that it's outside the Brillouin zone. It really physically corresponds to a lattice vibration with a wavelength that's shorter than the lattice spacing, which is unphysical. So we have to map it back inside the Brillouin zone with a, with a reciprocal lattice vector G, meaning it really belongs over there where the red solid line is. 
Now you can see that that, you know, that has changed the momentum. That's flipped it around, and that has destroyed momentum. That's an umklop process. And those umklop processes can lower the, uh, the lattice thermal conductivity. These can occur for electrons, too. But they don't occur as often because the electrons tend to be near the center of the Brillouin zone. They have smaller wave vectors, and these kind of processes don't happen as often. Okay. So uh, we need a large population of these large Q states in order for this scattering to occur. So that means we need a high temperature so that the window function is broad and we're populating these high Q states near the zone boundary. And uh, if you just go through the, uh, the uh, Bose-Einstein factor, and if I were to say, well, at high temperatures, then the argument of that exponential is going to be small, so I can expand e to the x as uh, one, plus, 1 plus x, I guess. And that means that the ones will cancel out, and the number of phonons is going to be kT divided by h bar omega. That kind of makes physical sense. KT is the thermal energy. H bar omega is the energy of the phonon. So the number is just KT divided by H bar omega. The scattering rate would be proportional to N, which means it would be proportional to temperature. So you would expect these processes to get more important at high temperature. All right. OK. So the scattering summary. We have uh, this, the scattering rate is going to be the sum of the scattering rates due to defects, due to bound, scattering off of boundaries, due to the umklep processes. The mean free path is velocity times that, so I could have a mean free path due to defect scattering, a mean free path due to boundary scattering, a mean free path due to umklep processes. You know, if you look at how those work out, you know, we would have to you go to you know, textbooks and people work this out. If I scatter from a defect, the, the scattering time goes as omega to the fourth. That's called Raleigh scattering. That's the same kind of scattering as scattering light in the atmosphere off a dust particle or something. The boundary and surface scattering, you think, would have something to do with the time it takes for a phonon to get to the boundary. So that's velocity divided by the thickness of the sample. The umklep processes have something to do with how hot it is and how many of those large wavelength uh, large wave vector phonons I have that can lead to those. Uh, I gave you a simple argument. Uh, people use a more complicated fitting to describe that generally. Okay. Okay, so then we can wrap up by seeing if we can understand some measured uh, characteristics. So these are some calculations uh, comparing. So this is, if you put in the you know, theoretical scattering rates for these different processes, work out these integrals, compare it to the experimentally measured thermal conductivity of silicon, you can see that the theoretical expression that we've developed works well, fits the measured data. And the measured data has the thermal conductivity dropping at low temperatures, reaching a peak, and then dropping at high temperatures. And if we want to understand that, you know, the thermal conductivity has two things. It has an, a number of channels and a mean-free path. If I look at the number of channels, when I'm at very low temperature, that window function is very sharply peaked, and just a few of the channels near the, near the center of the Brillouin zone are occupied. So there's a small number of channels. But as you increase the temperature, you start occupying more and more of those. Initially, the number goes as T cubed. Okay? And then finally, you saturate because you occupy all of the channels. So that T cubed is similar to the specific is it T cubed or T to the 3 halves? It's the same as the specific heat, whatever that is. Um, but it's the product of the number of channels and the mean free path. So if you look at the mean free path, um, if you're at low temperatures and you have very little phonon phonon scattering, you might be limited by the boundaries. Okay. As you get a little bit higher, uh, some of these defect scattering mechanisms become important. And as you get a little bit, you know, I mean, there, there you start getting um, more short wavelength phonons being populated. They are more strongly scattered by those small defects. That's why they become important. And then when you go to higher and higher temperatures, you have more and more of these phonons that can undergo these umklap processes. And your 
mean free path starts to drop. So you can understand this curve by the fact that initially you're dominated by boundary scattering because there's the mean free path is very long, you scatter off of the boundaries, but the thermal conductivity is increasing because you're occupying more and more channels. Okay. Then you get the channels all occupied and you're dominated by scattering from various types of defects. And then as you continue to increase the temperature, your mean free path starts to suffer. It turns around and goes down. Okay. Okay, so um, you know, just then quickly about going back, you know, why did all of the expressions look so similar, right? Electrons and phonons, we can go back and forth. Why do we get such differences? You know, wh why do thermal conductivities vary only over a few orders of magnitude, factor of a thousand or so, and electrical conductivities vary over a 20 orders of magnitude? Well, if you look at the mean free paths, they're, they're actually relatively close. You know, they're, they're not too different. So it all comes from the modes. Now, the difference is in the average number of channels. For phonons, it doesn't take much temperature. The, the, the dispersion is very small on the order of KT. All of the modes in the Brillouin zone are occupied. For electrons, you can occupy the modes by positioning a Fermi level. You have put the Fermi level way below the conduction band and you have virtually none occupied. You put them close and you have orders of magnitude more modes participating. You push it into the band and you have even more. So you can vary the number of modes that carry electrical current by, order, by orders of magnitude. Uh, you, you can't do very much about that. You can, you know, different materials have different dispersions. Heavier atoms have lower vibration frequencies, which means they have lower energies and lower bandwidths. So there's some variation in the bandwidth, but it's not huge. A mean free pass can vary, but again, they're not, not 20 orders of magnitude. So you get this vast difference between the range of thermal and electrical conductivities. Now the other thing that I will mention, you know, I don't have a nice, I had this nice beautiful picture of quantized electrical conductance where people did experiments and it just you controlled the width of a channel and the conductance just went up in units of 2 q squared over h. Uh, it's hard to do that kind of experiment for phonons, you know, to vary the width of the channel electrically, say, and watch those things happen. But people have done experiments and have measured this quantum of thermal conductance. If you go down to very low temperatures where uh, the transport is ballistic, so it's the phonon transmission at low temperatures, so that T would be one. And if you have a very small nanostructure, in this particular experiment they had some thin little beams on a suspended nanostructure, and they computed the phonon modes and they had four of them. And when they went down to low enough temperature that they observed ballistic transport, what they measured for their thermal conductance was four times this quantum of thermal conductance. So it too is a well-established experimental fact that thermal conductance is quantized. All right, so let me just summarize. You can easily extend the model that we had for electrical conduction and you can get all of the same mathematical expressions that people that work on heat transport have worked with for a long time. Just as for electrons, uh, phonon transport or heat transport is quantized, but this difference in bandwidth has, a, has a important consequences. It means we have to deal with the entire Brillouin zone for phonons. And the Dubai model just isn't very good. And the fact that we have no Fermi level means it's, you can't control the population of phonons over orders of magnitude. So there are lots of good books. Uh, you know, the first two are textbooks. The second one by Gang Chen is more recent and talks about uh, a lot of the recent work on nanostructures and thermoelectric effects, you might find that interesting. These two classic references that I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, this is the, the reference from the group that first measured quantized thermal conductance. And all of the results that I've shown here are described in more detail in this paper by uh, my student Chang Wook, who's the co-author with me on this talk here this morning. Okay, so we'll end there and see if you uh, have any questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, do we have a simple model to understand the number of modes for phonons?
I mean, we're not trying to have a part of the robot vision. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I'm not as familiar with what people, I mean, this is a standard thing. People do a lot of calculations um, imposing correct boundary conditions on a beam or a slab or a nanowire or something. And uh, there's been a lot of work and there are even standard packages for computing phonon dispersions. Yeah. Changwuk, which one did you use to compute those phonon dispersions? General practice, uh, right. general practice okay. So you might see Changwuk at the break, but there's, you know, there, there's, there, there's been an awful lot of work done about how you get the right, right phonon modes. And when you go to nanostructures, you know, the modes change quite a lot. In terms of the, in terms of our formulation, it just means that we have a different M of E that we have to put in. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I had a question in red about the, uh, the confined phonon. So, like, we, we learned throughout this uh, summer school that you know, it doesn't make any sense to look at phonon with uh, at a scale that's basically uh, the minimum wavelength they could have is basically two uh, uh, nanometer, you know, in semiconductor. And uh, you said also in the lecture today that uh, confined phonons, you know, Planck uh, would be important that basically the dimensions of the structure is much more than that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, could you maybe talk, uh, comment on how, like when does it become important to look at confined phonon band structure as opposed to like a bulk phonon band structure? Well, okay, so there's a question about confined phonon band structures. You know, I think, so my point there is, if you think about electrons and you want to know when quantum confinement becomes important, let's say you have a well and you want to know whether the energy levels are quantized, what you would do is you would look at the de Broglie wavelength of an average electron and you would look at the dimension of the well and if the two are comparable then you would think, well I have to solve a particle on a box problem and figure out what they are. And as I pointed out, the average wavelength of a phonon is, is much shorter. So that would lead you to believe that the quantum confinement effects you know, w would occur in much smaller dimensions. Now on the other hand, you just do elastic theory and compute the dispersions and you'll see changes in the modes at much larger dimensions. You know, you just do conventional elastic theory and let's say you have a slab, you impose boundary conditions on it. Um, you can, you know, you have different types of modes propagating in a beam or in a thin sheet uh, or in a rod. And these are the kind of calculations that people do on, on these small structures. So they're basically using bulk elastic continuum theory, uh, but they're just imposing the proper boundary conditions on a, on a material. Yeah. Uh, Tom. What happens when the main free path of the phonons uh, gets close to important device dimensions? And also, uh, when would, when do you expect that to occur? Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, again, when I'm responding to these questions, you have to realize that I'm a, I'm a double lead trying to figure out what this, you know, how I can understand these papers that I read on phonon transport. So I don't have a lot of experience with this. But, you know, I know ballistic phonon transport is something that people worry about. Uh, even when you look at those temperature dependent characteristics, even when you have a large chunk of material that you're trying to measure the thermal conductivity of bulk silicon and you go down to very low temperatures, the mean free paths can get very long and they attribute part of that drop to boundary scattering. Um, you know, we can estimate phonon mean free paths uh, you know, people like in thin SOI structures, I think the lattice thermal conductivity would be considerably less than it is in bulk silicon. I don't know, I think there's a lot of data on this. I don't know if it's an order of magnitude less or what. And then you have these simple expressions. You know, you can estimate, just as I went through some examples where we estimated the mean free path for electrons in a MOSFET, if you know the measured thermal conductivity and you know the specific heat, um, you can you can estimate what the mean free path would. And then, you know, what that would, I guess what that would tell you is that, you know, your question is what would you expect to see? 
you know, then you, you might, you start expecting to see uh, boundary roughness scattering. So you start expecting to see the mean free path to drop, which I guess is why, is probably why SOI films have a lower thermal conductivity than bulk silicon, because you're scattering off of the boundaries. You know, another possibility could be that their dispersion has changed. So I'm not, you know, I'm not exactly calibrated on which one is the most important. It's probably the roughness scattering. You know, these nanowires that people, you know, uh, the Majumdar group in Berkeley measured, uh, they, had, they had roughened silicon nanowires. I think these were on the order of diameters of 10 to 20 nanometers. And the roughness there lowered the thermal conductivity by a factor of 100. So at, at those dimensions, you know, the, the boundaries were enormously important. Let's see, I think. So, uh, is there any indigenous kind of analog of one of them? Yeah, there, there is. There is, an, and, and I don't know anything about it, really. I know that Professor Fisher here, you know, does NEGF calculations of phonon transport. So there is a quantum theory of phonon transport. And yeah, I don't know very much about that work, but you know, we could go over here to the Burke Center and uh, talk with Professor Fisher. But I, I know there are people that do these calculations. Yeah, so, and, and you know also, you'll frequently hear people talk about a phonon-Boltzmann equation. You know, and just as I talked yesterday that you can do these things with a Boltzmann equation. It's more common to see these kind of calculations done with a phonon-Boltzmann equation. And then, just like there's an, a, there is a NEGF to do a quantum version of the of the Boltzmann equation for electrons, there's an NEGF to do a quantum version of, of the phonon Boltzmann equation. Yeah. Can you turn back to slide number 30? Which one? Slide number 30. 30, okay. Uh, this one here? Oops, was that the one? Yes, uh, I'm talking about this V, V, H, V, 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 I was speaking about acoustic phonons or optic phonons in this expression. Well, so, yeah, so that's a good question, and, and, you know, and that's the difficulty. When you go through standard textbook descriptions, this, this is done very simply, and you get an argument like this. And, you know, when you do those kind of things, you usually think that, well, this is probably the, the longitudinal acoustic sound velocity. But if you want to know what it really is, you know, th this is what it is. And it means you actually have to do this integral, you know, over the density of states. At any energy, it's the average velocity of all of the phonon branches that have a density of states at that particular energy and you have to do that integral numerically. And, you know, if I, that reference that I gave you uh, at the end, the paper by Changwook, he shows, a, he shows a calculation of this for silicon and compares it to the longitudinal acoustic sound velocity, and it is actually is quite different. You know, so it's something that, You know, it's something that you need to be aware of. It's common to, to use an expression like that and say, well, I've measured my lattice thermal conductivity. I know my specific heat. I'll assume that the average velocity is the sound velocity, and then I'll deduce what the mean free path is. But it's not so simple to know what that average velocity is. All right, you've got to do a numerical calculation. Maybe I missed the, uh, the one that goes to Particular acoustic phones and optical phones. Okay. Well, so for acoustic, it's what? Five, six thousand, uh, five, six thousand kilometers per second, is it? No. Yeah, what? 100 times smaller. Let, just one second here. Yeah, 5,000 meters per second or so, something on that order. For, for acoustic or for, for optical? Pardon me? 
Oh, this is for some. So the, the optic phonons are, are very small, right? Because their slope is very, very low. But they have some finite slope. But, you know, this would be for the longitudinal. There are transverse also. They have, they have lower velocities. They participate in heat flow also, right? And then we come back to slide number nine. Yeah. Okay, so let's see, slide number nine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you see that the velocity that people would usually think of as the velocity that the heat, that the phonons that are carrying the heat is at, is the, for the longitudinal acoustic because that's the highest velocity, right? But those transverse acoustic will be carrying some of the heat too. And even the optical phonons might might have a little bit of a role. Right. Okay. Yeah, in, in describing uh, in the scattering yeah. of the, the G back there, which takes you uh, yeah. between three of these others, yeah. is that is that momentum transferred to the crystal as a whole, or the lattice as a whole? Or yeah. Yeah, does that? You know, where, where did that momentum go? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. That's something we can think about over the coffee break, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So you think it is conserved, but, but we well, you might lose it in a photo. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Let me let, let, let's think about that a little bit. I guess he's at uh, 45. Mm -hmm. Slide 45. Yeah. This one? Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, that's because, you know, this is the way I calculate my dispersion. And the dispersion is like considers a, a perfect crystal corresponding by springs. You know, when you do those calculations of dispersion, this is. This is the potential that you assume. So under those conditions, you have a perfect crystal and the phonons just, just travel through. There's nothing to scatter them, right? The dispersion tells me how, how carriers propagate in the absence of scattering, right? Now, I've neglected these higher order terms. And you know we think of those higher order terms then as perturbations. And they they knock them from one state to another in that uh, in that dispersion. Yeah. Same way, you know, electrons travel through the electron dispersion without scattering. The scattering potentials are something else. Yeah. 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 Yeah